Yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, C++ at the South, South Pole. Um, but at a fairly uh, different level. I'm not actually going to talk about any of the C++ that we actually do. In fact, I'm going to show almost no code uh, in this talk at all. And the only code that I will show is uh, C, like just straight C. And that's only on one slide. <coughs> uh, but I'm, what I'm going to talk about is you know, what I've been doing for the last uh, couple of years, which is trying to um, essentially educate my workforce. Um, I've been on Ice Cube for, uh, that's almost 12 years now. Uh, the first chunk was as a physicist. That's my background. I started as a physicist. And over the last five years, I've been working solely on software. And then as the last two, as a software coordinator uh, for this project. And it was taking over um, uh, as software coordinator that made me really look into um, a lot of the problems that we were they felt we were having in software development. And it sounds like it's a lot of the similar problems that um, you know, other people have as well in completely different fields. Um, yeah, so I've shown this. Uh, this is how I start a lot of my boot camps. I try to give advice to graduate students and postdocs to learn all the tricks you can while you're still young. But the message for this audience is going to be uh, slightly different. So my advice for you guys, because I'm assuming you guys know all the tricks. If you guys are here, you guys are probably software engineers already. So my advice to you guys would be to teach all the best practices you can and teach them to the other people in your uh, organization. <clears throat> so how many people are scientists on some level? I mean, not computer scientists. Not to say that's not a science. I'm just... Real science. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to say that, but uh, okay. And how many people have worked with scientists um, on some project, like trying to get them to code? Okay, so even, yeah, a little bit more. Um, yeah. What I'm finding from talking to people and going to talks around here is that I think our problems aren't as unique as maybe I initially thought we were. Um, at some point I thought, well, you know, we're having issues developing software. Well, maybe it's the fact that you know, we all have, we're, we're trying to do this with physicists hackers. But what I'm finding is that it's not necessarily entirely true. It seems like people have what I am now calling hackers in almost every sort of organization. So I think um, there, th there, there are things that we can do to actually improve this. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Ice Cube. I'm assuming that if you're here, you either want to know about what I've been doing to try to turn my hackers into engineers or you wanted to learn about what Ice Cube is. Uh, so I'm going to try to cover both. If it is, I think more and more people are actually using Slack these days. Is that right? How many people use Slack? Okay, so only about uh, half. Um, so we've actually found this to be incredibly successful for improving uh, productivity. Uh, when we first started using Slack, we had maybe 40 people in our IRC channel. Um, within the first week, we were up to 80, and then that doubled again a week later. Uh, now we have roughly 500 people in our largest Slack channel, which is actually more than the number of collaborators we have in the entire experiment. Um, so it has been an incredibly successful uh, app for us to, to get everyone together. And it's important for us because we're spread out across the entire planet. Um, in one sentence, I would say it's IRC on steroids. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so it's a messaging app. And, you know, we at Ice Cube, we see through the earth. And I'll explain a little bit what that means uh, later. <sighs> okay, so now I'm going to start with just why Ice Cube. Um, 
So there are things that we know. So we know that there are hadrons showering in the upper atmosphere at energies way beyond what we can produce in any terrestrial experiment. I mean, there's a really, really high energy. It's like we're talking six orders of magnitude higher than what the LAC is producing right now. <clears throat> but we don't know where they come from. We have absolutely no idea. We know they're charged, which means that as they traverse the galaxy, they get bent by galactic or intergalactic magnetic fields. They change the direction. So the direction that they enter the atmosphere doesn't necessarily point back to their source. We have no idea where they're coming from. And we don't know what type of particle they are. Uh, for the longest time, people thought, well, maybe it's something exotic. Maybe it's a Suzy cue ball, or maybe it's a monopole. Um, we're pretty sure that it's just some kind of heavy nuclei, but we don't know what kind. It could be anywhere in between a proton and iron, and anything in between. Uh, we don't know. But if they're nuclei and they're accelerated in some incredibly energetic process, the most energetic process that we know of right now, or at least in the visible universe, are gamma ray bursts. So if they're creating gamma ray bursts and they're accelerated to very high energies, we would expect neutrinos to exist at those same high energies. Right? In the rest frame of these particles that are being accelerated, they're going to decay, they're going to produce neutrinos, the neutrinos boosted to our reference frame is going to be about the energy of these guys. So we're expecting to see incredibly high energy neutrinos. So neutrinos are incredibly weak interacting particles. They're neutral, they're fundamental, so they don't decay. Um, and the fact that they're weakly interacting, this is how we see through the Earth. So we're actually at the South Pole, and for a lot of our analyses, we use the Earth as a filter. You know, a lot of particles shower in the upper atmosphere. They create lots of background for us. So we don't look at things that are down going for us. So we look at things that are up going. Because that's how we uh, get rid of a lot of our background. <clears throat> and the nice thing about neutrinos is that and they don't interact with anything in between us and the source. So we have the potential to see things that maybe traditional telescopes can't see. So IceCube is not just an observatory, or it's not just a telescope, it's also an observatory. So we look for a lot of other things. Figuring out where the high energy cosmic rays are coming from is not the only thing we're trying to do. Uh, so we also look for exotic neutrino oscillations, um, Lorentz invariance violations. We haven't seen any yet, but we're looking. Uh, dark matter signals, so we look for WIMPs. And these are, uh, these would be WIMPs that are collected either in the center of the sun or the center of the Earth. Um, so we look in that direction to see if they annihilate and produce neutrinos in their final state. Uh, we're also looking for SUSY signatures. These are things that are, um, or we get particle interactions at the very high energy in the atmosphere. Right? So if anything that's being produced at the LAC right now is gonna be produced in the upper atmosphere. Um, so we look for SUSY signatures, we look for magnetic monopoles. If anyone's taken a basic electrodynamic course, your professor probably told you there's no such thing as magnetic monopoles. Well, there could be magnetic monopoles, and we're trying to look for those. In fact, there are several models that say there should be magnetic monopoles. And then we also look for micro black holes. If you've read anything about the LHC, how when it fires up and starts colliding, we're all going to die because it's going to produce a micro black hole, it's going to suck us all in, so we shouldn't fire up the LHC so we don't all die. <clears throat> well, if the LHC was going to produce micro black holes, they would have been produced already in the upper atmosphere. Sorry, what was that? In the towards Lorentz variance, is a micro. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, and the detection of those is actually fairly weird. It's not a strict timing uh, calculation. It's, they actually show up <laughs> in uh, distortions of the neutrino oscillation, so deviations from standard neutrino oscillations. Um, 
Okay, so what is Ice Cube and you know, how do we actually how do we actually look for neutrinos? So it turns out that at the South Pole, um, there's lots and lots of water. So there's 9,000 feet of water, frozen water at the South Pole. And water has traditionally been used for uh, neutrino detection. You get a interaction in your ice, creates secondary particles that we can actually detect. Um, they emit light in the visible. Water is a great transmission source for that. Um, so we look for uh, lots of water. <clears throat> okay. And we want it to be uh, deep because we want to at least you know, get rid of some uh, background. Uh, so we have a deep in the ice and it turns out in the upper part of the ice uh, it's really, really dusty. So we actually don't get great signals in the upper part of the ice. And that's just leftover volcanic ash um, that's accumulated over the millennia. Uh, but below that, we get to fairly clear ice and our detection medium is actually really pretty good. So the top in the center of the detector, that's our the, the ice cube lab. And that's what you see on Slack when it comes up that picture, that first picture in Slack, you see that building. Um, that's the guy right in the middle of our detector. And that's where all of our electronics are housed. So all of the computers that do all of the processing signal in the uh, ice, they all exist in that room. And then each of our detectors, uh, we essentially have uh, housed PMTs, so photomultiplier tubes, in these pressure spheres that can detect single photons. How big are they, the spheres? Uh, the spheres are about this big. So they're 10 inch PMTs in, yeah, it's lar larger than a basketball. So they're 17 meters apart. We instrument the entire volume um, on strings. These strings are about 125 meters in separation of this hexagonal grid. And so the length of the string, at least the instrumented part, is a kilometer. And then the cross-sectional area from the top down is a square kilometer. So we get a cubic kilometer of instrumented ice, and that's where we came up with the name Ice Cube. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I've used this slide in talks like a lot. And this is, um, you know, this is an attempt to show the scale of our experiment. Right, you have a little picture of the Eiffel Tower, and this is, <clears throat> you can see, well, you stack about maybe two or three Eiffel Towers on top of each other, and that'll give you some idea of how big our experiment is. And I used this slide for, I don't know, maybe, uh, you know, seven years before I actually ever went to Paris. But I found myself in Paris once at the base of the Eiffel Tower and I looked up and I tr imagined three of these stacked on top of each other. And it wasn't until then that I realized our detector is really, really big. Yeah, it's big. So I thought, well, for this crowd, I want to use something a little bit different. So how many space needles, how many space needles is our detector? And it turns out it's about six and a half space needles. So if you're local, if you're staying around for a while, or you get a chance to find yourself at the base of the Space Needle, just stop, look up, take a minute to imagine six of these, or six and a half of these stacked on top of each other. And that's how big our uh, detector is. Okay, so how do we make it? <laughs> so this is our hot water drill. The first thing that we have to do is uh, drill through the fern, and the fern is about 50 meters of compact snow. So it's just a copper coil on a conical shape that we run hot water through. And then we inject hot water um, through this uh, drill. And we go for about two days. This whole process takes about uh, two days. I remember when I was down there, we actually had a um, a group of distinguished visitors, so a couple, uh, so it was one senator, a couple congressmen and their staff, 
uh, they were down there. And one person, we happened to be drilling at the time, and one person was amazed at how fast this process went because he had some experience in the oil drilling industry. And it, apparently in oil dr drilling, when you're drilling through rock, you don't actually get to see the thing move, um, but you could actually see our hot water drill move. It was really, really slow, and for me, two days seemed like a long time, but for him, that was just blazing fast. <clears throat> okay, so this is what a, a typical event will look like. So each of these single dots, the white dots, is one of our modules. And um, so in this event display, red indicates early time, and then green out into the blue indicates uh, late time. Um, so a track, if it enters in our detector in that side of the detector, that'll all be red, this will be blue, and it's not too tough to see how you might reconstruct that and figure out which direction um, that track came from. And for a lot of analyses, this is a great first start. Right? I mean, you can think of us as being like a telescope. If you have the position of the sky, you can start making sky maps and images, right? like normal telescopes. But we often want a lot of other information as well. We'd like to know what energy it is. Um, for this particular event, this is actually real data. So it lasted uh, just under four microseconds. And the energy that we reconstructed was about 71 TeV. And just to get like, kind of a sense of scale, this is about just under 10 times the collision energy that the LHC is colliding at uh, right now. And for us, this is relatively low energy. This is where things start to get interesting uh, for us. We want to go to much, much higher energies so we can see things that are coming, hopefully, from extragalactic sources. And here's one more uh, animation just to kind of illustrate what happens. So we get an interaction, secondary particle travels through the detector, emits Trankoff radiation, which is, has you know, some component in the visible. <coughs> some component in the visible. Um, emits photons, photons are detected in our detector from that we reconstruct the direction that the track came from. <coughs> and this is the collaboration. It's made up of uh, 40 different institutions. We're spread out across the entire planet. We see a lot in uh, North America, a lot in Europe, uh, but even in Japan, Korea, Australia and New Zealand. <clears throat> so it's great to be able to work with quite a diverse uh, group of people, but this isn't a strict hierarchical organization, it's a collaboration. And that's also one of the things that makes it uh, a little bit difficult, especially from, I would say, a software management side of things. We're kind of a hybrid organization. We're not exactly open source, but we're kind of like, we sort of almost operate like an open source sort of environment. Um, people kindly volunteer their time to help out with software. But they're also expected, on some level, to volunteer some of their time. So sometimes they volunteer, sometimes they get volunteered. Okay, so this is, um, this is the part of the software uh, that I'm, well, I'm not really gonna talk about this. I'm not gonna say anything more really beyond this, but this is the, section, the sector of our software that I've been focused on for the last couple of years, and this is where most of the C++ is. In the green, I describe our simulation. All of this happens at the north, so none of that happens at the south pole. Uh, we start with an initial event, and we want to be able to swap these out because we have lots of different events that we want to simulate. We want to simulate background, then we have lots of different signals. And signal to one person uh, is going to mean something very different. <clears throat> it really depends on the analysis that you're doing. So we need to propagate the final state leptons through our detector 
we need to propagate the photons, and we use GPUs uh, to do the photon propagation now. And then the detector response and the trigger, everything that um, is in the ice cube lab in the center of the detector in that building, we have to uh, simulate that response as well. And then we get to various levels of filtering. We can't push everything that we that the detector sees over the satellite. We only have about 100 gigabytes per day uh, to do this. So we start filtering out events that we think are interesting. And this happens in um, various stages that don't really need to go into. But right there in the filtering, this is where the simulation and data meets. In our case, our data is actually um, um, acquired in our data acquisition system um, through Java. So that's, that's only a one box right there, and I'm not going to talk about that anymore. This is a C++ conference, and I don't know anything about Java, really. <clears throat> I only know that I don't want to know more about Java. <laughs> so the level one and level two filtering, that all happens, that's the C++ at the South Pole. And then the level three filtering, and then the analysis starts uh, in the north. And this whole box is our physics software. That's what I've been calling our physics software. It's developed and maintained mostly by physicists. We've had a couple engineers uh, over the years come and help us out. Um, but this consists of uh, 100 projects and about a million lines of code. 70% of it is C++. Um, and what I'm actually curious to hear from yeah. Does anyone think a million lines of code is large? Okay. Okay, so a few people, yeah, I think it's large. How many people work on larger code bases than a million lines of code? Okay, cool. So on a million line code base, how many full-time, say, software developers would you put on a project? And we don't need, we don't need hands, you could just like throw out numbers. If you have any idea, 10? Okay, so half a million and you have four. Yeah. Okay. Continue to develop 40. If you continue to develop 40? Okay. Any, any more numbers? Okay, so we have one. <laughs> um, and that's me. And to say, I, I'm the only one who's full-time, I should say that. Um, we have a lot of other people who are working on the code, but they don't do it full-time. They all have different responsibilities. And I also, I, it can be argued that I have other responsibilities as well. It's my job to manage this project. So the amount of time I spent on, spend on management and the amount of time I spend on code still isn't really 100%. So you might even be able to argue that we have zero people working full-time on it. And we are continuing to develop it as well. It's a lot of maintenance, but we still uh, want to develop it. So when I started as software coordinator, one of the things I decided to do was actually look into what is our maintenance burden. So just count up the number of lines of code, how many people have agreed to maintain that, and um, just start looking. What, what, what does it look like? Is it you know, reasonably equitable? Do we have a lot of abandoned wear? And it turns out we have a lot of abandoned wear. Um, right, that's a good chunk of software in production that has no maintainer. And it turns out this top slice, um, that corresponds to the code that one uh, postdoc who had recently become a tenure track professor um, agreed to be put down on paper as the emergency contact. But I don't know how many people have ever gone through the tenure track uh, route, but when you're a tenure track professor in the first five years, you're focused on getting tenure. You don't have a lot of time to work with software. <clears throat> so, and once he realized that he was up here in the largest slice, he quickly abandoned a lot of that software, rightly so. So we had to find uh, other people to uh, take this over. And to make matters even worse is that some of these larger slices uh, down here, uh, those are actually being maintained by uh, graduate students, um, good software people, 
who we were only lucky enough to have them graduate and stay on the experiment. And that's unusual for uh, science. Typically, you graduate, you move to a different experiment. Uh, but we were lucky enough to keep them. But we could have ended up in a situation where half of our production code uh, was abandoned where. So I put a lot of work into finding people to uh, maintain all of our code. And so this was uh, this spring. We got to the point where we had no abandoned software uh, whatsoever. On paper, we had people who were dedicated to maintaining all of our production software. Still not, you know, fairly equitable. We have a good chunk of it being maintained only by a few people, but, but at least we're making progress. <clears throat> so, it was at about this time last year at this conference, I started thinking, okay, well, what would Google do? And the only reason I started thinking about what Google would do was because I went to Titus Winter's talk at this conference last year, and he gave me two numbers that I could actually use as a benchmark. So now I have one single data point where I can start comparing, well, how are we doing compared to maybe what other people in the industry do? So he said they have 100 million lines of code and they have 5,000 C++ engineers. So, you know, roughly 20,000 lines of code uh, per engineer. So we have around 700,000 lines of C++. And we have 40 hackers. So about 17 and a half thousand lines of code uh, per hacker. So right now we're actually looking okay, right? It's, it's well, not too bad. <clears throat> yeah, so I guess I have my own definition of hacker uh, that will hopefully come out in this talk. And I, I don't use it the same way a lot of other people use it. I don't necessarily you know, mean to be pejorative. It's just, you know, it's a term that represents to me one person in their state of development, their state of development as a developer. Okay. And anyway, we, we've all been here, at least I've been here. Right? I've, I've been a hacker, I've written bad code. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, nobody starts out writing good code, I don't, I don't think, maybe some of you have. <clears throat> okay, so one thing I started thinking about, it's like, well, on paper, the numbers look okay. Right? We, yeah, we look okay. But there's, they're, they're, they're not the same. And on this side, right, I, I'm going to continue to use the Google engineer, um, but I'm gonna guess that most people in this room are on the left-hand side of this equation. The professional software engineers, this is just the generic professional software engineer. Was that <laughs> a little bit further to the left? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and on the right, right, is our typical, um, I would say, Ice Cube software hacker. And not all of them. Um, again, I, I, I think we have some very solid software guys in our organization. A few of them have actually gone on to work at Google, so um, I'm not talking about everyone on Ice Cube, or everyone even you know, with a science background who's hacking code. Um, but I'm more interested in the, the group as a whole and how do we operate as an organization. So we can make some fairly simple uh, assumptions just starting off. I heard, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard that Google allows their employees to spend one day a week just doing whatever, whatever they want. So, Let's assume they spend 80% of their time on the job that they were hired for. So if they're hired as a C++ software engineer, they're probably spending about 80% of their time doing or thinking about, maybe they're in meetings about C++ software. Um, on IceCube, we only expect um, people to spend 20% of their time on software or some form, some form of service work. We don't actually get 20%. In rare cases, we can get 20%, but in reality, it's closer to, I would say, five. In many cases, maybe less than 
so this factor of four, I think, is still fairly conservative. And then I want to make a bold assumption and say that if Google hires a C++ software engineer, they're probably going to expect that engineer to know C++. <coughs> Ice Cube hackers aren't. They come from, we come from various backgrounds. Some may have never taken a C++ course. Um, I remember when, when I was a graduate student on uh, a bar, my advisor said, we're on an experiment that uses C++. Here's a book, come back on Monday and be ready to hack. And I think that's the way most people learn C++. Right? You don't take a proper course. You just kind of hack as you go. And you, know, you end up kind of programming like C with a few extra features when you think you can exercise them. <clears throat> so I get this number from the mythical man month and this you know, claims that there might be a factor of anywhere from five to 10 in one software organization. And this is the level of productivity between your productive software people and maybe your poor performers. Um, you know, for us, it could actually be one. Again, I think we have some pretty solid people. Um, but it could, it could be much less than this. I think that you know, estimate in the mythical man month at least assumes that that person who was hired into the organization, again, knows the language that they're, <coughs> that they're uh, coding in and actually has some interest in software development. Right? And it's not necessarily true of uh, physicists and, and scientists in general. Some of them, we just simply do it as a means to an end. You're on an experiment, you have to hack code. That's why you're, that's why you're coding. And then there are, there are a lot of other factors that could weigh in. And, you know, we continue this, and really the equation will look something like this. All right, you sum over all of the people in your organization, you multiply all these efficiency factors together, if you can even estimate what they are, uh, you want to normalize it to one over M because, you know, you just want to know, well, how many people do I need in my organization per Google uh, engineer? And now uh, that I know the number of lines of code, how many people do I actually need to put in this project? Not that we actually want to do this. But, <clears throat> again, some of the things that will factor in, the fraction of time spent on software, the language proficiency and your desire to, you know, hone your software development skills. And then also uh, maintainability of inherited code. If you're inheriting code that was designed by an engineer whose one of their main goals is to write maintainable code, I'm gonna argue that that code is probably much easier to maintain than code that was hacked together by a graduate student as their first software experiment or experience. Right. So there's obviously no way to do this analytically. Uh, best you can do is fire up Deep Thought, let it run for seven and a half million years, and you get the answer right, that we all expect. Right. So it's gonna take 42 ice cubers per Google engineer. <clears throat> so I didn't do this, obviously. But, I mean, considering how in just two slides we were able to get to a factor of 20, Maybe that number was higher. You can add in a lot of other efficiency factors. This factor of 40, like, you know, at least an order of magnitude, maybe two orders of magnitude, is not completely crazy. The, the real number might be somewhere in there, right? And, you know, there's not a lot we can necessarily do about this. We can't just go out and multiply our workforce by a factor of 42. But what we can do is we can teach the people that we actually have the people that we have on paper and try to make them and turn them into more product, productive software people. <clears throat> so we need to invest in education, invest in the education of our people. So we have a diverse physics program, and this is one of the things that makes our problem particularly difficult. And it's expected to collect data for 15 to 20 years. So, you know, it's not something we can just hack together, run for a couple of years, and that's it, let it fall, um, you know, into flames. And then we're also studying future extensions to IceCube. So this could potentially run for uh, several decades. Um, 
we use the software to extend it to look at detectors or possible detector designs at both higher energies and lower energies. If those detectors actually get built, we'll probably use the same software on those experiments as well. So we're talking about decades long uh, lifetime of the uh, experiment and the code. And it requires that the software be flexible and extensible. And this is often not what you get from a graduate student where this is their first project. They may know some C++ and they're kind of hacking through things. <laughs> and I would say they spend probably most of their time struggling with the language itself and not really thinking about design and maintainability and how long their software is gonna last um, right, at that higher level. I would say probably what a lot of people in this room actually strive for, um, but you, know, you probably didn't do this in your first software project. And they have no training or experience in design and software engineering. So my goal is to try to provide this to them. All right, so if we're gonna continue with this model, and at least for us, we really kind of have to. Uh, we can't go out and hire a team of uh, professional software people. Um, this is the model in, I would say in probably most of big science. Um, you know, high energy physics, the LHC, they, I've, I've talked to those people and they have essentially the same thing. They develop software the same way. They have graduate students and postdocs uh, developing a lot of the code. They're bigger, they have some software engineers, probably a lot more than we do, but essentially they have a, um, a similar model. It's the graduate students and the postdocs who are writing the code. Uh, okay. Yeah, so. So when thinking about where our graduate students are starting from, I was watching this documentary once, and it was about primates. And the primatologist um, said, that, well, there's a difference between gorillas, uh, chimpanzees, and orangutans. And the difference is, is that for a gorilla, for example, if you give them a screwdriver, they'll take the screwdriver and they'll bang on the cage until they get bored with it. Um, whereas the chimpanzee, you give the chimpanzee the same screwdriver, and they'll use the screwdriver for everything except its intended purpose. Whereas an orangutan, if you give an orangutan a screwdriver, the orangutan will use the screwdriver to disassemble the cage while you're not looking. <laughs> and I thought this kind of, you know, in one succinct anecdote, kind of describes my development as a software developer. Right? At the beginning, you're just wrestling with the compiler. Right? You don't know why the compiler is complaining. But you're just kind of banging on the compiler and you keep banging until you either get bored or it stops complaining. And you don't worry about uh, warnings, right? Warnings can be suppressed with the compiler flag. Right, you get it to stop complaining and then you move on to the real work of what Dan Sachs said the other day. You move on to the real work of debugging. <laughs> and you go like this for quite a while. Well, maybe some longer than others. And then you get to the chimpanzee level, right? You learn some new tricks. You learn about templates. You learn, maybe you learn about template matter programming, right? You learn about object-oriented programming and you're feeling pretty good about yourself. So you start using these. But you often use these for everything except their intended purpose. You don't know what their intended purpose is. You just, you know, learn these new cool tricks and you want to use them. But then you start reading, you know, Sutter, Myers, Alexandrescu, and you get to the orangutan level. <clears throat> and my goal in my organization is try to get everybody to the orangutan level. It would be nice to get to the point to where when I'm not looking, they write great software. So, students have a lot of pressures on them. 
they have a lot to do. <clears throat> I mean, I went through this entire process, so I understand you know, what they're going through. I'm not trying to you know, blame anyone or call anyone out. Uh, there's a lot to do in the course of um, you know, getting a PhD in astral particle physics. There's the high energy physics core curriculum. Well, you gotta start with the, just the regular core curriculum of physics, and that's about there in the upper left. If you're going to do high energy physics, you should take some particle physics. Um, you gotta take two semesters of quantum field theory. And if you're gonna do the, if you're gonna go into astral part particle physics, contrary to popular belief, astral particle physics is hard. <clears throat> You need to learn a specialized theory. If you're going to uh, be in an experiment like Ice Cube and try to detect uh, neutrinos from GRBs, you should know something about GRB dynamics. Um, if you're gonna do uh, monopole detection, well, you probably should spend some time learning about modern gut theories. Then you have to learn about detector hardware. You gotta know how the PMT works. Um, you need to know how your detector works. You need to know how photons propagate through ice. There's a lot to learn. And then there's analysis technique. Once you actually have the data, how do you crunch it? Right? How do you reduce it? How do you separate signal from background? And that's you know, a large and diverse field. And then you gotta mix in some astrophysics and you should probably learn some general relativity along the way. <clears throat> We're talking about things on cosmological distances, right? And then there's simulation techniques on top of that. You need to learn some simulation. So there's a, a lot to learn. And you might, there might be some elective courses in scientific computing offered at universities, but I'm gonna guess that they're probably taught in the same vein as numerical recipes. And I took this right out of numerical recipes. It says that it's not a textbook on programming or on best programming practices or on C++ or on software engineering. At least the third edition was in C++ and not you know, C or Fortran. Um, but I'm gonna guess that most scientific computing courses probably don't spend a lot of time talking about what's the best way to organize software, what's the best way to code, just get the algorithms done and you're good. <clears throat> right. So on top of that, we're going to dump C++ on them. And I've heard it said before, C++ is hard. Um, I don't know, this crowd might use different language. We might say that it's rich and expressive. But there's a lot to learn. And if you want to be a good, solid C++ engineer, there is a lot to learn. Right? I mean, I've been doing this for a while and I'm still learning. Um, and to me, that's one of the fun things about C++. <clears throat> but I like, I like to use this quote often. But the problem with physics today is that it's become so complicated but the, that by the time a physicist has learned everything that they need to know, in order to do physics, they're too old to solve them. And then we're trying to dump one more thing um, onto graduate students. All right, here's one more thing on top of everything that you need to know in order to do physics. <coughs> Sorry. The upside is, is that students actually want to learn. And that's, I think one of the things that I found fairly surprising that we, we were actually in a state where a lot of their C++, there wasn't a lot of development necessarily going on in C++. The code was largely frozen, the detector obviously frozen. <clears throat> um, and we thought most people are just going to be focused on getting their PhDs. And they can do almost all of that at the Python level. They don't have to touch C++ if they don't want to. But I asked people, well, what, what would you like to learn about? So we're gonna, looking into starting up boot camps. Um, and there are two things I think to take away from this. Is that uh, one, well, maybe three things. First thing obviously is that students want to learn. They wanna learn more about software. Um, but this also tells us where they're actually at. Right, if you, if you want to learn about intermediate level and for us, I would say this is like basic C++. What is a class? Have you ever written a class? If you haven't written a class, then you're gonna be in that blue kind of stripe right there. So this tells us that a large fraction of students have maybe have never written a class uh, in their life. Um, in the orange, that's more like object-oriented programming. 
Right, so this tells us the large fraction of students who want to learn more about software probably don't know much or anything about object-oriented programming. And then very few um, actually wanted to get to what I called the guru level, which is, do you want to learn about C++ template metaprogramming? I think only one person said that they did. <clears throat> and, well, the other was kind of a joke. Uh, somebody wanted to learn how to uh, code by manipulating the uh, wings of a butterfly so that it you know, translates to the cosmic rays and somehow magically um, you know, allows you to write code that way. But it turns out there's an Emacs command that'll do that. <laughs> <clears throat> so I wanted to learn, so I wanted to figure out, okay, well, where kind of are my people and, and, and where should we start from? All right, so let's not get into super advanced C++ techniques, but we focus on uh, really the, uh, the basics. Okay, yeah, so up there at that level, again, back to our primate analogy, right? So these are where the gorillas are, right, up at the top. And in the middle are the chimpanzees, or at least people wanting to get to the chimpanzee level. And then, uh, but what we actually want to get, or what I would like to get uh, a large fraction of my uh, team to get to is that orangutan level. So we're probably not gonna do a lot of C++ template metaprogramming, but it would be nice to get them to the level to where they can appreciate it and at least understand it. I mean, you have to know a lot about templates in order to um, do template metaprogramming. <clears throat> okay, so this is one of the first things that I did uh, when I started as coordinator, is that I started a strike team. Now the idea is to you know, get a bunch of collaborators together and form a team um, where we at least have some interest in software development and then train them to attack problems that are too daunting for a single individual, right? It's, instead of you know, working uh, as individuals, let's work as a team. And I thought, well, okay, <clears throat> so we'll have an advanced boot camp. So we'll have one week, we'll set aside one week. We'll spend maybe about half of it on advanced Python and half of it on advanced C++. And then we'll go out and we'll attack problems. It turns out one week wasn't enough. <clears throat> but, and, um, you know, I'm a physicist by training, by nature. And I remember this, uh, this joke that one of my instructors um, told us in class when I was an undergraduate. That you know the difference between a mathematician and a physicist? So if you give a mathematician a problem, that they'll constantly work on it until they find a solution. Whereas a physicist will constantly redefine the problem until it's so simple even he can do it. So this is what I did. So I said, well, okay, so maybe we're not gonna have a team that after one week of training, we're gonna go out and we're gonna attack problems. So instead, let's turn this into maybe a year-long training program. And if you know, I get a postdoc for a year and I train them and they go on to some other experiment um, and I don't actually get the productivity out of them, that's fine, like, I'm, I'm okay with that. Because it helps the scientific community uh, in general. Uh, some of them we do keep and you know, we get some great work out of them. So after that, I started uh, monthly, week-long code sprints. And this is largely an attempt to get people to, if you promise to spend 20% of your time doing software, show up to the code sprint, that's your 20%, and work on software. So again, I realized that one single boot camp wasn't gonna be enough, and we weren't gonna be able to reach everyone with a single boot camp. You can't just teach one um, session at one level and try to reach all of your gorillas, chimps, and orangutans. Right? You need to segment this up. So what we started doing is that we have bi-yearly meetings. So we started um, other sessions. So we start teaching people at the beginner level during those. And then we have a two-day uh, boot camp. 
to kind of reach that intermediate level. So the week long is still advanced. Those are our orangutans. The two days are for the chimpanzees. And then the single session uh, beginner levels, right? Those are our gorillas. <clears throat> and then uh, just this year, I realized, well, why not just don't limit the advanced boot camps to just the strike team. Let's open it up to the entire collaboration because it turns out that there were more people than I thought who were interested in advanced programming techniques um, than I realized. And this was just one comment that I heard from the last boot camp that we ran from an ICQ graduate student, that this is the first boot camp where I actually learned something. And I thought this was really nice because, again, I thought you know nobody would be interested in learning C++ anymore. Uh, Graduate students probably just want to graduate. They can focus on Python. Why would they care about C++? Uh, but they do. So it was a you know, really pretty positive experience. Oh, and, we, and in one of these boot camps, we even had one session on increasing test coverage. And this is in our production code. Um, and I don't know how many people in this room feel about writing tests, but it seems like the general consensus is, is that they can be kind of painful. They're not necessarily fun. So asking somebody to write tests and increase code coverage, I actually thought that might be a completely crazy idea and nobody would actually like it. And it turns out we actually had a really pretty good response. They like the fact that they are able to um, touch real production code uh, and contribute to the collaboration in a meaningful way. So that was, and, and they learned something along the way. Uh, so that was another thing that I, that I thought was really surprising. You can ask people to write tests and documentation and have it actually be a good, positive learning experience for them. Okay, so this is also one way I try to recruit, I try to get people onto the strike team. Um, it's a great way to learn how your code works. Everyone um, who does anything on IceCube is gonna rely on this software, at least on some level. It's easy to get through this without having to know anything, but people actually want to learn how their code really works. And it's also a great way to hone software skills. Again, one of the things I found that was fairly surprising is that more people actually want to hone their software skills than um, I think I initially assumed, then a lot of other people around me uh, assumed as well. And this was another testimonial from uh, a former Strike Team member, actually left uh, Ice Cube to get a software job. And he was saying that he got lots of questions, in, and this was in the interview, about a lot of the things that we cover at the boot camp. So GDB, how do you debug using GDB, uh, CMake, uh, so C++ containers in Python. He said he wouldn't be able to answer without um, what he learned in uh, the boot camps. He didn't think he would have had a chance of getting through this interview process um, without the boot camps. So it's another kind of upside of, at least in, um, in physics, you know, teaching people, or our physicists, more software skills. Because not everyone gets to be a physicist when they grow up. A lot of us go on um, to software jobs. So, you know, it doesn't hurt to start honing your skills early. <clears throat> this is a book that I discovered just recently. Uh, I think it was in the beginning part of this year. And I really liked it. I know, I saw Peter on the schedule. I know he's here at this conference. Um, I haven't actually met him yet, but I think this is a really uh, great book. Um, you can, so there's just a, a listing of all of the uh, chapters, so it starts with C++ basics, uh, covers classic uh, classes, um, starts off with generic programming, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting, <clears throat> but gets into gener generic programming straight away. Talks a little bit about libraries, and not just the STL, but there's also a little bit of something about Boost in there, and then other you know scientific libraries, C++ scientific libraries that you might want to use. Uh, and it gets into metaprogramming. And these are kind of the basics of metaprogramming. And then object-oriented programming, and there's one scientific project uh, at the end. So I really, really like this book because there's, there's not only, it doesn't only just cover the language 
and cover modern C++ all the way up to 14. Uh, but there's also a lot of great advice about how to actually write software. Um, so there's some best practices built into it. And starting in January, I'm actually gonna to put together a, a virtual course because I know that there are a lot of people in our organization who can't necessarily travel to boot camps and would like something that's a little bit more self-paced. Um, yeah, so starting in January, we're gonna to try to cover all the material in the book. We're gonna have weekly online sessions to uh, talk about exercises and solutions and I don't know, maybe we'll put this up on uh, GitHub. <clears throat> and then we'll finish with the final project. And it'll be the same final project that I used uh, for the last bootcamp, which is re-implement our framework. We have a framework um, that essentially controls um, lots of different uh, plugins, and these are plugins written in C++, the framework is written in C++. Um, so let's re-implement it. And it gets them thinking about um, design at a higher level. Not only how our current framework is designed, but also thinking about maybe some of the mistakes that we made in designing the framework over the years. <clears throat> okay, so, okay, so this is how it went. Um, yeah, so we, so we started off with just basic in classes. We even got into object-oriented programming. I kind of switched the order. Um, that it was presented in the book. And then we spent a good chunk of time, like two and a half days on just generic programming. Uh, so working with uh, templates. And then at the end, we even uh, got a little bit into uh, metaprogramming, uh, which was, yeah, really kind of things. So one of the things that we learned was that students actually prefer uh, hacking to lectures. So we actually scaled back the lectures a bit and allowed a lot of time for hacking. I mean, students can, read, they can, they're gonna learn better by actually working through exercises um, than they would do actually listening to somebody talk about C++. <clears throat> so we also use the C++ coding standards as a, as a teaching tool. So not simply as a list of rules that you have to follow in order to get your code into production, um, but we use it to teach and we try to mix these in to all of the lectures. And one of my favorite ones, and this is what I try to get across to everybody on our project who's writing software, is that our mantra should be that correctness, simplicity, and clarity come first. And I know that those are all three things that come first, but <clears throat> they're all really important. I would say equally important. And the way I would say many of us write code is that we are not many of us, but when we're starting out as, as a physicist hacker, the way we would generally write code is that we would focus solely on correctness. You hack until the thing is correct, and then you're done. But I get the impression that engineers actually move on and think about the other two. How simple is it? Is this the most robust code that I can write? And how clear is it? Is, is it going to be understandable to somebody else? Because that's also I would say equally important. And all of these things are important, again, for keeping our fellow collaborators out of rabbit holes. Or what uh, the Dave Seckel would say, it's reducing our technical debt, if you guys went to his talk yesterday. Another one that I like to teach is give one entity one cohesive responsibility. The problem is this, is that you, I mean, you could say this. You could say, well, give one entity one cohesive responsibility. It's not entirely clear when you've given one entity one cohesive responsibility. You wrote it, you know exactly what it does. It's in your head, it's cohesive, right? So one of the things that I try to teach people is write tests while you develop and write inline documentation immediately. If it's not easy to test, or not easy to write documentation, you might be giving your entity too much responsibility. So that gets them, again, thinking about tests and documentation slightly differently, not simply as uh, a checkbox that needs to be checked off in order to get your code into production, but actually as a design tool itself. 
And again, to try to answer the question, how do you know whether you're, you've given your entity one cohesive responsibility? So this is um, actually an example. I changed the name of the class um, because this is from a fairly large, uh, ubiquitous scientific uh, code base. Uh, so I changed the names, I didn't want to call anyone out. But I use this as an example of what not to do. So this is their uh, mother of all object class. This is the base class to which every single base class in their system inherits from. And this is the doc stream. Again, we're looking at the documentation. So how can you, from the documentation, tell whether you've given this entity one cohesive responsibility? Okay, so this class provides a default behavior and protocol for all objects in the system. It provides protocol for object I.O., error handling, sorting, inspection, printing, drawing, etc. I didn't, I didn't write the et cetera. That's in their documentation. So at some point they gave up listing what this class can actually do. <laughs> so how do you write a test for et cetera? If you were to try to test this, like how would you do this? Hopefully at this point you would quickly realize maybe I'm giving this um, entity too much responsibility. So the documentation further goes on to say that the bits can be used as flags. Bits 0 through 13 and 24 through 31 are reserved as global bits, while bits 14 through 23 can be used in different class hierarchies. Watch out for overlaps. <laughs> this, is, this is also in their documentation. I didn't add that. Uh, okay, yeah. So another principle that I try to get across to people is don't leave for documentation what the compiler can enforce. Right? Don't leave these warnings, or if you find yourself writing these warnings in your documentation, okay, think, okay, how can I um, code this in such a way that the compiler actually handles it? <sighs> okay, and this is one, uh, this, is the, this is the C code uh, that I'm gonna show. This is, for, uh, this is the simple histogram class. And again, another example of uh, don't leave documentation for what the co compiler can enforce. And to me, this is one of the big differences between C and C++. Right? In C, this is how you would code this. You have a histogram as a size n, as a pointer to a range in bin. Okay, in the documentation it says, well, th those are arrays. But there's nothing in there that necessarily says that those are arrays. So there's just pointers to doubles, and n is size t. You can take this, you can create a GSL histogram. You can do anything you want to with those members. It's not gonna work with any algorithms that take GSL histograms, but nothing prevents you from doing this. Um, all right. <clears throat> and again, so this is one of the, I would say one of the big differences between C and C++. C is, I think, more of a live free or die kind of language. You can do anything you want to with anything. Whereas C++ is more of a, this is not non-do, there are rules. And you can actually use the compiler to enforce the rules and to get it to, to get your users to adhere to your design principles. Okay, so last year's commits, again, I think we're doing fairly well. Um, this is, um, yeah. So this is basically a fraction of people who uh, committed last year. And taking the uh, second, fourth, ninth, 10th, and 11th spots are all strike team members. And I think none of the people uh, would have committed on this level uh, if they hadn't actually gone through boot camps and decided to join the strike team. So it's working. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm almost done. I know I'm kind of running over a little bit. Um, but this is one thing that I want to try to start up. Maybe it's C++ now if anybody's planning on going. Uh, next year, or next spring. Um, so this is the Boost Library official maintainer program. So if anybody's actually interested in joining, uh, definitely let me know. This is originally pro proposed by Robert in uh, C++ Now in 2015. But Rachel Chang suggested that we actually use Blom as a way to train. Like, why not? This is actually something similar to what we do in Ice Cube. Uh, we could do the same thing in, in Boost. <coughs> So now I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. So the takeaway from this is, again, 
teach best practices because it's incredibly important. Because if builders built buildings the way, I would say, hackers write programs, then the first woodpecker that came along would destroy civilization. Right. I know everybody in this room doesn't necessarily write code like this anymore, but I think it's worth your time to focus on the hackers, you know, the gorillas, the chimpanzees in your organization, and to teach them. It can actually make you more efficient in the end. <clears throat> yeah, so here's a you know, whole list of things that I've already covered uh, in this talk. The final one is uh, explain code to your dog. And I like this one a lot. I learned this from one of our guys at, uh, at Madison. He's another strong software guy. Um, but yeah, so this is Rooster. He's my coding partner, and he's the guy who I explain my code to. Uh, he doesn't necessarily understand everything just yet, but you know that's my fault that I'm still working on my software development skills. And that's it. <laughs>